It's great to be here. Um, Pastor asked me to speak a couple of weeks ago. Um, and of course, you know, it's not Easter Sunday, but I get the week after, which is just as fun you'd be. Um, so I'm very glad to be here. Um, I'm very glad to have the chance to speak uh, at my home church. It's always a blessing to do so. Um, I'm going to warn everybody right now, it's a long passage, so just bear with me. So if you can turn in your Bibles to Acts 1, and while you guys are doing that, I've got a serious question to start everything off with, and I really, got you, I really need everybody's honest opinion on this. Ready? Here it comes. Where was everybody the day that Tom Brady signed away from New England to join the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Look, it's a silly question, but I've got to ask you. For me, I'm almost 30. I'm 29, so I'm almost 30. Math. So, for the majority of my life, I've only known two things. Tom Brady's the greatest quarterback of all time, and we have six championships to prove it, along with nine appearances. If you're not from New England, I'm sorry, your team's probably awful. But the reason I ask you this is because when, when Brady left, for those of us who are 29 and younger, all we've known have been just complete and utter dominant Super Bowls and uh, excellence for 20 years. Well, oddly enough, I actually remember where I was the day one time Brady signed away. I was at work. It was about 9 o'clock in the morning. And like a good employee, I had my headphone listening to the radio. And um, I stopped what I was doing because the radio, the morning show host just, he's like, hey, everybody stop. Brady's signing with Tampa Bay. And like the radio went quiet. I heard one guy go, And I turned around, and I told my coworkers, I'm like, guys, Tam uh, Brady just signed with Tampa Bay. And they just went, whoa. And then one of them said, I got to go call my bookie and ran out of the room. But listen, <laughs> it's, it's weird how something so si like seemingly silly, it really is silly when you think about it. You know, Tom Brady's a grown man. He can do whatever he wants. Come back, Tom. But um, it's, it's funny how something as silly as that leaves such an impression. Let me, let me give you another example. All right, let's, let's get serious right now. Do you guys remember where you were 10 years ago yesterday, the day of the marathon bombing? I remember that very well. I was, at, I was in college. We were getting ready for a big event that day um, off campus. So like every other guy and girl running around, we're trying to get our, our, our tuxedos or whatever, our suits, because it was actually a big event. And all of a sudden, we get this text on the emergency school text line that says, event canceled. Everybody's supposed to remain on campus. You're not allowed to leave for anything. We turn on the news and the radio, and we're hearing that there was a bombing at the at the the finish line, and we have no idea what's going on. And then during the course of the night, you hear that the the police are chasing him through Belmont and Watertown. So the first thing I do is I call my parents and I go, "Are you guys okay?" He goes, "My dad at the time he goes, These cop cars and SWAT vehicles running through the streets like they must be catching on to this guy." So if I were to ask everybody in this room, "Do you remember where you were on the day of the marathon bombing?" I would imagine, especially if you're from Boston, you kind of remember that event. And it's really funny when we think about things like that, how even something as, as dumb as the uh, Tom Brady leaving has such an impact and an emotional uh, um, scar on us. You know, the marathon bombing, of course, you go back even further, 9-11, go farther back than that. You, you recall the, uh, where were you when the JFK assassination took place? Things that have such a strong emotional uh, connection with us they stick with us forever. And not just things that happen on a national or an international level, but even some mundane things in our lives. You know, do you remember your first girlfriend or boyfriend, your first breakup? Do you remember the day your dad taught you to shave, the first time you, you drove a car? Things like that, they, they stick with us for a very specific reason. And oftentimes, they can be kind of silly or, or weird or important. Now, let me ask you this, and this one I really need you to um, put your thinking caps on. Imagine being part of the early church, the, the 11 disciples or the, the other followers with them, all right? And you've, you, you're one of the faithful who've stood by Jesus since he started his ministry. For three years, you followed him everywhere. I mean, you've seen him, uh, you've seen him feed 5,000 people. You've seen him cast demons out. You've seen him do all these miraculous things. And in your mind, you're going, oh, yeah, yeah, this is the guy. We're going to stick it to the Roman Empire. We're going to win, and we're going to take back the kingdom of, of Israel. It's going to be so good. And then you were there for the crucifixion. You saw Jesus' broken, twisted body in the most humiliating manner, just hanging there. And now you've gone from, this is the greatest, to, 
what, what do I do now? Like, where, where do we go from here? So you hide for three days, whether that's in the upper room with the other disciples, or maybe you just you go home wherever you're from. Maybe you're not from Jerusalem. Maybe you're from Samaria or something. And then three days later, you're hearing reports about, hey, Jesus is alive. And you kind of, you don't know how to respond to that because you literally saw him, had the, the stuffing beat out of him and, and broken on the cross. And then he appears to you in some form or fashion, not just like in a dream or a vision. No, he physically is standing in front of you. And now, you're, now you have no choice but to go, all right, we're back on track. Jesus is back. He's really going to give it to the Romans now. And then 40 days later, you're on the, the Mount of Olives with Jesus. He's giving you these teachings and commands. And then you watch him go up into the sky back to heaven. And now you're going, what is going on? Because I've just seen all this stuff happen. And now he's gone. Well, where do we go from here? The good news for us and the good news for the early church is the story doesn't end there. The title of today's message is, What's Next? The story goes on because with Jesus, there's always more. There's always more when Jesus is involved. Now, before we we read our text, I want to kind of, as quickly as we can, uh, sum up the end of the gospel so that we all kind of understand where we are at this point in Scripture. Uh, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, the end of Matthew's gospel. Jesus gives his disciples the Great Commission where he tells them to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, that's huge in and of itself right there. When Christianity first starts out, it's, one, it's a 100% Jewish movement. No one in uh, Jesus' original um, followers are anything but Jewish. Now Jesus is telling his disciples, hey, guess what? You're not staying home. You're going to go into the whole world and preach the gospel. Which, by the way, the whole world at the time for uh, anybody living under Roman rule was as far north as the Germanic tribes in northern Europe as far west as Spain, as far south as northern Africa, and as far west as Mesopotamia, Persia. I think that's it. I was really good at history, but I should have looked at a map before this. The point is, the whole known world is under Roman rule. So when Jesus tells them, hey, you're going to go into the whole world and preach the gospel, he's not saying, hey, stay on Smith Street in Jerusalem and you know have a, a house church there. No, he's telling them to go. He's telling them to go into the whole world and change this world. Jewish movement into a movement for everybody. It's not, Christianity is not an exclusive club. It's for everybody. So he tells them to go into all the world. That's the first thing. Then he tells them to baptize everyone who becomes a disciple in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them to teach them to observe all that Jesus had taught and commanded them, the original disciples. Luke and Mark, and in very similar fashion, uh, fashion, excuse me. Both of them, uh, both of them record the early appearances of the physical risen Jesus to the disciples and those with them. Jesus giving the great commission again and his ascension into heaven. And John ends in a more, it gives a more intimate look between Jesus and his disciples, where the time uh, Jesus spends in those 40 days with John, James, Peter, and the remaining disciples. It's very personal. They have dinner on the beach. Jesus restores uh, Peter to himself. It's a very intimate look. And at the end of John, we literally, uh, you could literally just so, you could literally ask yourself, well, is that it? No, there's more to the story. We're given a lot more in Acts. Luke uh, wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts. Both of them were written to a man named Theophilus. Who Theophilus was? We don't know. We're just told that both of them, uh, both of these books are going to a man named Theophilus. And that's how the book of Acts starts up, where Luke says, hey, Theophilus, here's part two. Luke covers Jesus' life and ministry, his death, burial, and resurrection. Acts covers the beginnings of the early church and its very first foundings. And it's a very deep book because you see the church wasn't perfect. They made a lot of mistakes, but they did a lot of good. And the second half of Acts has a lot to do with Paul's conversion from being a uh, killer of Christians, his personal encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and his conversion from a killer to a Christian, where he doesn't stay in Jerusalem. God literally tells him, all right, you're going to go into the world and preach the gospel. And he went all the way as far as Rome. He had even, tradition says that he had plans to go to Spain, unfortunately, 
He never got to go there that we know of. And so for our purposes today, we're picking up the story of the early church and the disciples in Acts 1-4. So if you're there, we'll start reading. Um, if I go too fast, I'm sorry. Like I said, there's a lot here um, that we have to get to. So Acts 1, verse 4. And while staying with them, uh, speaking of Jesus, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times and seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took, them out of their, uh, took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, we'll stop right there. Very, very briefly. Um, look at verse 4 and verse 8 for uh, just a quick moment. It's kind of silly to think that Jesus would tell them, stay here, and then a few verses later tell them to go. The good news is between verse 4 and verse 8, Jesus gives them more instructions than just stay and then go. Jesus mentions the arrival of the Holy Spirit and that a time is coming that when they get the Spirit, that is when their ministry begins. In fact, Jesus tells them that they're... Their mission, their goal is to start at home in Jerusalem, which there's nothing better than working from home, right? Working from home has got to be a sweet deal. You get to go to your favorite uh, muffin shop. I don't know if they had muffins back in that day, but, you know. Um, then he follows it up by, by the way, you're not staying in Jerusalem. Yeah, you're going to go to those places that you don't want to go to, like uh, Samaria. Samaria, historically, we know it's like the Alabama of Palestine, where you, you don't want to go to Samaria because they're ju just a bunch of banjo-playing redneck hillbillies. That's how they were viewed in that day. Um, so Jesus tells his disciples, you're going to go to a place that makes you very uncomfortable because those people, they still need to know about the gospel. Oh, and by the way, you're not done there. You're going to go even farther. You're going to go to the ends of the earth, which again means the entire known Roman world and beyond. See, God's call to his people is first to love God, but it's also to love people by preaching the gospel to all so that everybody in this world will be given a chance to be redeemed from their sins. The church may have begun in Israel, but it's spread throughout the Roman Empire. And by the way, in Philippians 4.22, Paul is writing his, um, the end to the, his letter to the Philippian church. And he mentions that there are Christians in Romans... Uh, Romans. Caesar's own household. That see, Caesar was the uh, oh, that's loud. Caesar was the most powerful man in the world at the time. I don't know if you knew that. And there are there are believers in the house of Caesar. If you don't think that the gospel can't do something miraculous there, what what are you what are you thinking? Yes. And by the way, when Paul was uh, under house arrest in Rome. He probably wasn't having, you know, Paul Blart security mall cops guarding him. No, they were Roman centurions. These guys were the Navy SEALs of the Roman Empire. He probably witnessed them day in and day out. Maybe one of them got saved. And maybe that one Roman centurion was the witness to Caesar. Maybe it was the guy scrubbing Caesar's floor or cooking his pita bread. I don't know. All we know is that the gospel didn't stay in one place. It spread like a fire. When you light a piece of paper on fire, it's spread. Uh, verse 9, Jesus is taken back into heaven, and those gathered are left kind of just standing there watching it happen, which is kind of funny. You know, you spent three years with Jesus, and you see him die and then resurrected, and he's giving you all these commands, and you're excited, and then he just vanishes into the sky, and you're kind of just left standing there like... What's, what's going on? I find this hilarious that in verse 10, uh, two messengers from heaven, two men of white appear. They had to have been just watching this go on. And they're like, why are you guys just staring up at the sky? Jesus gave you something to do. He's coming back. 
And he's coming back the same way that he went into heaven. And while the disciples, they did want to know the time when Jesus was coming back, he did tell them, it's not for you to know. All you've got to do is do exactly what I've told you to do. Make disciples and baptize them and, and further the gospel, right? And so we see at the end of our passage here at verse uh, 13, that the, uh, the disciples, they, they disband, they go back to Jerusalem, and we know that they're together, united in prayer. Um, the rest of chapter 1, they pick a, a replacement for Judas, um, to join the 12. And at the end of chapter 1, we come to, to chapter 2 because the story doesn't end after one chapter. Chapter 2, verse 1 starts out like this. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of, as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language what they're saying? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said they are filled with new wine. Now, we see here, it's very, very open and, and plain for us to see that on the day of Pentecost, the early church of disciples, they were all together on this day. They were gathered together in one place at one time. And they're following what Jesus had told them to do, to wait in Jerusalem. They may not know how long that will be. All they know is that Jesus told them to wait. And those gathered in that room were gathered together uh, for the uh, Feast of Pentecost, as well as waiting for uh, the promise that Jesus had given to them. And those gathered were astonished for two reasons. Number one, imagine being in a room with all the doors and windows shut, and just this massive gust of wind just coming in from nowhere. Probably had someone sitting on a chair or something, about to take a bite of banana bread or something, and they're hit by this gust of wind, and they go flying, and the banana bread hits Peter in the face or something. I don't know. I like to put things in a funny lens. It clearly, it's failing. But um, that's number one. But number two, as this has happened, and they look around, they're starting to see these tongues as of fire um, appear over their heads, and they're probably going to be like, what was in that pita bread? What is going on? And all of a sudden, they start to realize that they're speaking in different languages, and they're astonished by this because Galileans weren't exactly the most educated people. That's why the people outside the, the upper room were very astonished by this. And these weren't just random languages that they were speaking. They weren't babbling and, and you know, running around screaming or something. No, they were speaking in languages that were known to the people gathered outside. And we see in those three verses, it's a lot of different languages. You've got uh, Egyptian um, Parthian, I don't know what that is, uh, Mesopotamia, Asia, Cappadocia, basically places and kingdoms from all over the Roman Empire. And these people are gathered together and they're stunned to see that these fishermen from Galilee are all of a sudden speaking the gospel in their own language. You see, the Holy Spirit, which had been promised by Jesus, had come. And the Spirit gave the disciples and those gathered with them the wisdom and the understanding to reveal the gospel to the masses outside in the languages that they understood. See, just a few verses earlier, those who followed Jesus and stood on the Mount of Olives, they may have been afraid, they may have been timid, they may not, they still probably didn't understand fully, you know, what Jesus had been teaching them in the first place. Now they're standing together in the center of Jerusalem, and Peter has the boldness to go before the crowd and give the gospel in multiple different languages to those who would hear. It's a complete 180. 
to have timidity and fear and then to go out there in, a, in front of people you don't know, people that probably hate you for all you know, and to give the gospel in such an effective manner. The Spirit gave them insight and boldness to do what Jesus had commanded, to them, uh, commanded them to do. Excuse me. Which is not to say that this is the only time the Holy Spirit appeared. The Holy Spirit's been active from the beginning of time. We see that in Genesis 1-2. Um, but this is the first time where the Spirit is active in his people at the day of Pentecost. And from verse 14 through 36, I, it's, it's a long passage for, for time's sake. I, we won't cover it. But Peter preaches to the crowds. And he reveals to them the scriptures through the scriptures that Jesus was the fulfillment of the law of Moses and the scriptures. That he came and he died for our sins, rose from the grave three days later, and is coming back one day. And the story keeps going. It does not end there. Because the crowds, or at least many of the crowds, they look on um, in verse 37 when Peter ends his, his sermon. They turn and cut to the heart because of the Spirit working in them. They ask Peter and those with them, what shall we do? Or how do we respond? What are we supposed to do with this information you've given us? And Peter tells them to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission and forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because of the disciples' quick response to the movement and the coming of the Spirit, the message of the gospel that day saved 3,000 people from their sins. And at the end of chapter 2, we see that because of their work on Pentecost, the church uh, continued to work together. They worked in unity. They, they sold all their possessions. They gave all their money to the church so that they can actively help people, the widows and the broken, um, and the continuation of people going out and giving the gospel to the world. And this transformation, this quick turnaround of, of the disciples, how they went from standing on a mountain, you know, kind of speechless, to these mighty men and women standing there giving the gospel in languages that they never understood beforehand. It's, it's amazing. See, even without Jesus there, his followers continued the work of the ministry that he had started there on earth. And it was because of Jesus that the story continued. You know, the rest of Acts, we learn so much about the work of the early church and about all that Paul had done. But what's important to remember is that these are only the first two chapters of Acts. Following Acts, by the way, there's 22 more books, letters written by Paul, Peter, James, John, Jude, training the, the, the church in their personal sanctification, how to handle situations, how they should speak, how they should act, how to become more like Jesus, because that's the ultimate goal of the believers in our personal sanctification. It's to deny ourselves every day and become more like him, which is the hard. It's not easy. It's very, very hard. In short, the story continues on. It doesn't end. So what now? Like, why do you keep saying the story goes on? What's, what's the point? We're not the early church. This is 2023. Tom Brady's gone. What are we supposed to do with this information that you've given us and all that? Let me, take, let me talk to those of you who are, are believers in, in Christ Jesus first. And let me ask you a simple question. What is your story? See, everybody here has a story to tell. For the believer, if you were to walk out those doors today and someone grabbed you and asked you what you learned in church today or how to be saved, number one, are you ready to give the gospel on a moment's notice? And number two, if not, or I'm sorry, if you are, is your story, your testimony part of Jesus saving your life? It should be. That's the hardest thing to do. Honestly, I am a people pleaser. I just want everybody to get along, everybody love everybody. I just want to be loved and accepted. Giving the gospel is hard because you're essentially telling somebody that their good works can't give them to heaven. And if uh, they don't get angry with you, then something's wrong because a lot of people just want to be told that their life is unicorns and cupcakes and happiness. But that's just not the reality. The reality is that your works can't get you to heaven because your sins outweigh your good works. Only Jesus can bridge the gap between you and the Father to save you from your sins, not your good works. Church history, for 2,000 years, even with its flaws, because Christians are still sinful, that's just how it is, despite the flaws in church history at times, the church is made up of millions of stories of broken and hurting people, of all races and creeds and, 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 and backgrounds who 
hated God until someone had the courage to tell them their story and give them the gospel and have a complete 180. They chose to make a 180 and change their life uh, for Christ. And you may think today that maybe your story is not some profound, you know, life-saving experience. You know, um, in the 1940s, World War II, um, a young Dutch woman, Corrie Ten Boom and her family, they were thrown into concentration camps for hiding and rescuing Jews trying to escape the Nazis. And at the end of the war, Corey ended up being the only one in her family to survive the concentration camps. Her entire family's gone. Devout Christians in Holland just obliterated because of the hatred of, of a group of people. Later on in her life, Corey became a famous Christian author and Christian public speaker. And in one of her, the end of one of her talks, she came face to face with a German man who walked up to her and said, Miss Ten Boom, I don't know if you know this, but... Uh, I was one of your captors at Ravensbrück. Ravensbrück was a work camp, one of the concentration camps in Germany. He went to her and said, I became a Christian, and when I heard you were speaking, I wanted to come and tell you that, and I was hoping you could forgive me. <sighs> How do you do that? To someone who committed such evil. They wiped your family out and put you through so much pain and misery and torment. And Corey Ten Boom later uh, told, someone, uh, told someone later on that without Jesus, there was no way she would ever been able to forgive um, that man. 1956, missionary Jim Elliott, his buddy Pete Fleming, and three others fly down to Ecuador to evangelize the people of the Aca, the Aca I'm going to mess this up, I'm sorry, the Aca tribe. And the five men, after several days of speaking to the, the native tribes down there, thought that they had an in with the people. And then the men of the village came and murdered them in cold blood because they were outsiders. But the story didn't end there. Because Jim's wife, Elizabeth, two years later with her daughter and, I can't read my, here we go, Rachel Saint, the wife, I'm sorry, the sister of Nate Saint, the pilot who flew Jim and the missionaries down to Ecuador, they went to the same place where Jim and his friends had died trying to give the gospel. And Elizabeth and Rachel reached the people of the Aka tribe. To this day, they're a friendly tribe with good, God-fearing Christian people in there. Some of Jim's kids still live among the missionary, uh, the, the people. But my story, you know, my story, it's nothing compared to these guys. It's nothing compared to Paul or Peter who... Peter was crucified upside down, as tradition says it, and Paul was beheaded by Nero himself. Like, come on. What can my story do for somebody else? 1980, Dunkin' Donuts, Wilmington, Massachusetts. An 18-year-old angry, zit-faced Bob Butler was working the night shift at McDonald's. Or McDonald's, Dunkin' Donuts. He'll kill me for messing that up. <laughs> night shift at Dunkin' Donuts, and he was getting really annoyed at the girls singing across the way that he was working with. And he asked her, what have you to be so happy about? Life is pain. And that young girl pulled her Bible out. Yeah, I'm going to cry. Here we go. And uh, by the way, Bob's my dad. I don't know if you knew that. This young girl gave Bob Butler the gospel. You know, I don't know much about my dad's life before 1980. Because in 1980, Bob Butler wasn't Bob Butler of Salem Street. He was Bob Butler, who had his life changed. Amen. He went to Bible college at Boston Baptist College, married my mom. They started a church in Cambridge and eventually came here. And for 31 years, he was the man. I don't know everybody's story. I just know because growing up with a man, it was annoying hearing about it all the time. But if you don't think that God can save a zit-faced, angry Bob Butler and that his story can't help other people, look around because everybody in here has been a part at some point of my dad's ministry. Amen. August 2010, a zit-faced, angry Kyle Butler um, was laying in his bed contemplating his number one fear, flying 
because I was going to visit my grandfather down in Melbourne, Florida. I wasn't, I'm not, I wasn't afraid of flying. Snakes, I'm afraid. I'm very afraid of snakes. I was afraid of death. I was afraid of death. You want to know some of the hardest people to reach sometimes? Pastors, kids. Because you grow up watching Veggie Tales and Adventures in Odyssey and singing silly songs with Larry your entire life. You put into a private Christian school for the first, how old was I? Dang. 13 years of your life. And then you go to a public school where in the private Christian school, nobody liked you because you were the nerdy kid who was into Star Wars. But you go to the public school, everybody loved you. You were loved and accepted. So what's the natural response? I want to be like everybody else. And you know what? Everybody else is scared of death. I was scared of death. I'm not anymore. Amen. Because August 2010, I don't know, I, I was up all night then. I don't know what exact time. But I just remember thinking, what happens if this plane goes down? Where am I going to go? What do I do? And everything that Bob Butler, Bill Smith, Bill Havens, Brian Spicer... Mike Patterson, Michael Forrestal, Bill Medeiros had been instilling in me my entire life. All of a sudden, these verses that I had been memorizing through silly songs with Larry and Adventures in Odyssey hit me like a, a bag of a, 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 a pillowcase full of soap. It hit me hard. And I chose that night. I don't want to be afraid of death. I put my life and my, my hope and my trust in Jesus Christ. I was baptized in that dusty baptism right there. I've grown up here. My, I've known no other church, and I don't want to know any other church. I've had the privilege of going to serving under my dad to serving Tim. It's a lot of fun to have two men of God to learn and serve under and serve with. See, our work, our calling doesn't call us to look at our story and go, ah, my testimony is lame. No one's going to want to listen to that. How do you know? We look at Paul as the greatest Christian missionary of all, time, of all time, and he's going, I killed Christians until I met Jesus. And we're looking there going, oh, I was saved in a Dunkin' Donuts. So? Someone had the boldness to give you the gospel. They were risking your rejection. We risk rejection on a daily basis when we choose to give the gospel to somebody. Our job is to give the gospel and leave the rest to Jesus because the story doesn't end there. It continues because Jesus is in the work. So for the Christian, if you think your story can't reach somebody, why? Why not? Now, we're going to, as I begin wrapping this up, I, I want to make a, a quick plea to those who maybe don't know the gospel or know Jesus today. Um, you've heard me up here have, heavily breathing into the microphone and screaming at you about this gospel. Well, it all sounds too good to be true that anybody would give their life for my sins. Because if you're telling me that my good works can't get me to, uh, to heaven, what do I do? Well, the good news is Jesus didn't just go on a cross to just die. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have eternal life. It's a complete heart change with Jesus. Jesus, Jesus changes everything. I've had the, a part of being in this church. I've seen family members of Michael, Stephen, and Debbie, and Billy, and countless others come to Christ. And the complete 180 is like, this isn't Stephen. This isn't Debbie. Who are these people? Amen. Growing up a pastor's kid, you see a lot of tough stuff. But you see a lot of the good that comes from the gospel. So when we're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's this. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved from the penalty of your sins. If you don't know how to do that, look, it's, it's really simple. The first thing that we have to do is we have to acknowledge that God is good and we are not. Romans 3.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God... Uh, oh, no, did I mess it up? He goes to Bible college. Anyway, um, we have to acknowledge that God is good and we are not. The second thing we need to do is we need to accept the reality that our good works, they literally can't get us to heaven, that only Jesus... Is the one who can pay the penalty for our sins. He's already done that. And the third and final thing we need to do is we just need to ask. That's all you need to do. And if you don't know, if you're interested and you want to know more after the service, come see me or Pastor Tim or Michael, Bill, Christina, Mandy, Doug. We'd be happy to share more with you because that's our job. And the asking part, if you really don't know how to, what to say, I believe there's a sinner's prayer in the bulletin. If you need a copy of the bulletin to know what it says, the sinner's prayer isn't in the Bible. Well, when you don't know what else to read, 
that's a great guide to read along with and actually understand what you're saying. We'd be happy to pray with you and to be with you in this moment of time. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for um, the beauty in the day. We thank you for everybody who's here, Lord. We, we, we just pray that this week as we go throughout our, our week at work and whatever we're doing this week, that we will remember that our story might be part of somebody else's story. Lord, help us to remember that as long as Jesus is in the work, we, uh, our work is not in vain. Lord, we thank you today. We love you. And we give you all the honor and glory and uh, praise, for it's in your name we pray. Amen.